Well, welcome to the second video today, and I will be taking up uh, in some in a different direction the, the topic that was raised in the last video. The topic for this video is truth and religious diversity, and I'll talk about the learning objectives as I go along. A um, couple of examples. Um, uh, the, it, 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 many people in their workplace or in their communities today um, will experience that there are people from multiple religious backgrounds, um, people in various professions, practicing the professions in your community, people teaching in, in the schools, um, people running businesses in the community, perhaps even um, the, 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 the young people that, uh, that, that meet in the high schools and the local colleges what to speak of our own families. Today, religious diversity uh, is a fact of life. Now, it's a sociological fact. There are obviously many different religious traditions on our planet. So this is a basic fact. Actually, religious diversity has always been the case. It's just that we're much more conscious of it now than we were before. So actually, there's nothing really controversial about the fact of religious difference. Religious diversity in this use of the word just means there are many religions on the planet. Now, that's to be distinguished uh, from the notion of uh, religious pluralism, uh, or to put that a little, in a little less jargony way, it's the idea of religious difference as a challenge. And on one approach, religious difference is just a fact. But on the other hand, religious difference can actually create a problem for people. And that's why I'd like to distinguish a bit between religious diversity as a social reality and religious diversity as a religious challenge or issue. Now, um, while it's true that we encounter many, we encounter people of many different religious backgrounds in our communities, it's not necessarily the case that we talk much about religion with people. And in fact, these days we're less likely to talk about these differences than ever before. Um, and so the, the issue may hardly ever come up. However, suppose you're traveling, you're on a plane, and uh, someone, you, you fall in, it's a long plane ride, and perhaps you fall into a conversation with, your, with the person next to you. And as you, as you discuss, as perhaps the conversation after the fifth or sixth hour gets a little bit deeper, perhaps you broach religious differences or religious issues. And then you, you perhaps say something that's meaningful to you, or the other person says something meaningful to them. And that person says to you, oh, well, it doesn't really make much of a difference, because after all, all religions are true, aren't they? They're all just different ways of talking about ultimate truth. Could be one, one possibility. Another person might gently insist that actually, or maybe not gently, that, that your path isn't as good as their path, or that, in fact, you're following a false path. All of these are possible responses that could occur. This is now when we enter into religious diversity as a, as a, as a challenge or as a problem, as an issue. The question arises, then, is one religion the true religion? Are all religions true? Are some religions more true than others? Is the question of truth not even relevant here? Is it just a matter of your, of your background, of your practice, of your preferences? These are some of the issues that, um, that arise when we take up the question as today's topic of truth and religious diversity. <clears throat> um, so, um, how, what kind of tools does theology uh, provide us with that can help us uh, deal with not the issue of religious diversity, that's a sociological uh, uh, in, uh, fact of interest, but the theological, philosophical, religious question, the burning issue about the truth of religions when there are so many is what I want to talk about today just for a few moments with you. And there are a number of ways of responding to this issue. I mentioned a few already. One is to say all religions are true. Another is to say only one religion is true. Each of the world's religions sees itself as the only truth. And that's not necessarily the case. All religions point to God or the absolute. All religions teach the same thing, the golden rule, for instance. And of course, to be a tolerant human being, we should see all religions as true. Or maybe we should risk not being tolerant and insist on the truth of one. And of course, given that there's so many differences, it will be impossible, after all, to get anyone to agree on any religious claim. We should just throw our hands up in skepticism and just say, obviously, with so much disagreement, religion can't be about anything at all. 
if everybody says something different, what could be common? What could, what can, religion, it doesn't, not like science, doesn't give us a kind of unified truth about anything. Well, I suggested that comparative religion can help us along those lines, as surprisingly can neuroscience, contemplative neuroscience. All right, so over the last 30 some odd years, a, a way of thinking about religious difference as a problem uh, has been developed in, in philosophy of religions and theology of religions, and it's called um, the tripolar typology, which is, of course, you know, a kind of a mouthful. But basically, it's a way of sorting into three categories these various responses that I just read out to you to the problem of religious differences. And if you were to have a conversation with a thousand theologians, philosophers, uh, uh, religious professionals, people you meet uh, uh, on, on the plane, your family members, and yourself, chances are you could sort the various ways of solving this problem into one of three categories. Now, this, these, these three categories are not final or, 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 you know, for all time. There have been many attempts to try to revise them or replace them, but in the end, the three just keep coming back. And uh, they are this. They are these. These are the three basic responses. You can sort the different uh, result, the different ways of interpreting religious difference into the, into the the uh, ex the category of exclusivism, the category or choice of inclusivism, and the category or choice of pluralism. So we have these three different categories: inclusive, excuse me, exclusivism, inclusivism, and pluralism. It's very easy to remember, and that doesn't necessarily mean that it's not, not, not true. It, maybe it isn't true. Maybe we'll find a fourth or a fifth real category. But generally, the other categories tend to dissolve into one of these three. Now, these have been, uh, these can be categorized in terms of, uh, of a mountain, if you will. Um, and, and so uh, there's an, an old saying that there are many ways up the mountain when it comes to matters religious. There are many ways up the mountain. Which of the three do you think that would be? Sounds like pluralism, doesn't it? There are many ways up the mountain. There's a mountaintop. You can get up, you can climb, you can take a circuitous route, you can take a more direct route. Maybe you can take a footpath that someone made, or maybe you can get out your climbing equipment, or maybe, I don't know, in our time and place, you can get a helicopter ride to the top. But there, it's still the top. There's one top, many ways to get there. That's pluralism. Now, um, uh, exclusivism would say that, yes, there's one mountain, but there's only one way up the mountain. And, you know, analogies do break down at certain points. So it's obvious that there's not one way up the mountain. But in using this illustration, we would say that's like saying there's only one way up the mountain. And um, uh, inclusivism would say that there are many, there's one mountain and many ways up the mountain. And one kind of pluralism says there's one mountain and many ways up the mountain, which, of course, sounds like inclusivism, which it basically is, if you put it that way. So pluralism kind of reformulated itself because of a lot of criticism, and it became, on one, on one version, there are lots of mountains and there are lots of ways up the many mountains. Many mountains, many ways up. So there you have three different ways of dealing with religious difference. Um, there's one true religion, and generally people who think there's only one true religion think it's theirs. They don't usually think there's only one true religion, and it's yours. And then there are the inclusivists, and this is a pretty broadly populated category, people who think our religious tradition is the ultimate or the true one, but we're open to all of these other traditions, and maybe they have some truth as well. And the pluralist, who generally claims, is thought to claim that there's only, that there's one, one, one mountain or one truth, but many ways to approach it. Now, that's an old-fashioned form of pluralism. The way, I artic the way I would state pluralism is simply this, that reality is infinite, and the different ways of explaining reality have never been exhausted and can never be exhausted or used up by all of the words in human history. That's why there's all these new religions, because there's a new way of saying the old story of the relationship to the divine, to reality, a new way of talking about that, a new poetry, a new scripture is revealed, a new prophet comes on the scene, a, a new sage begins to teach deep wisdom. And what that person says resonates in a way that the old teachings no longer do for some people, and thus a new religious tradition is born. 
Now, there are, of course, uh, some risks with, uh, with this approach, with spiritual pluralism, and I would say the major risk is, is as with the last, uh, in the last video, that it can be disconcerting for people. They can feel as if they're losing their way when, when it becomes clear that, in fact, other religious traditions may be true or at least have some validity.